Welcome to Laws 13013 Legal Professional Conduct Topic 4 Money Matters Part 2 Trust Accounting I'm Stephen Colbrand. Trust accounting is a particularly important practical topic as it's an area that solicitors frequently get into trouble with either through deliberate fraud or more commonly just through ignorance or a lack of attention to detail. Our intention then is to build up your knowledge of the theory and practical application of trust accounting. With that in mind we're going to have a look at the requirements of the Legal Profession Act 2007 and associated regulations. We'll be looking at how you construct a trust account receipt and manage deposits. We'll look at um, the requirements in relation to trust account checks the actual cash books required, namely the cash payments book and the trust receipts cash book. We'll look at the journals, the ledgers and bank reconciliations that are required, the trust account authorities that you'll need to obtain, how you handle controlled money and also the requirement of the prescribed account deposits. There are various documents which you'll need to read, in particular the Legal Profession Act 2007 Part 3.3 and also the equivalent Part 3.3 in the Legal Profession Regulations. These detail the legal requirements in relation to trust accounting. To actually help you understand trust accounting, the Queensland Law Society has produced a trust accounting guide which you can access from their website free of charge. And um, I would uh, suggest that that's uh, an important document for you to spend time studying. Trust accounting, like uh, all areas of the law, has its own language which traverses both law and accounting. You'll find that um, some of the terms are defined in the legislation and regulations but other terms are not. What I've done is set out the key terms in the glossary found in the iTunes um, binder for this particular course. And I think you should spend some time becoming familiar with those particular terms. In terms of trust accounting, you're going to have to deal with the concept of double entry bookkeeping. Often the um, reaction to this is for students to say, I'm a lawyer, I'm not an accountant. Unfortunately, in, with respect to trust accounting, you actually have to be both a lawyer and an accountant. There are two main accounts that uh, law firms have. They have a general business account and then they have a trust account. These are two distinct and separate accounts. The client provides money on trust to the law firm for certain purposes. Hence, the law firm has incurred a trust liability to their client and have received funds into their trust account. And those funds must be properly accounted for and managed. In any accounting system, you tend to have debits and credits. And these two concepts must uh, equal. Generally, there's a, an equation which summarizes the um, capital assets and liabilities of any particular business. And namely, the equation is that capital, that is the amount of the owner's investment in the business, equals the assets, which is something of value that the business owns, minus liabilities. These are the things that the business owes. So capital equals assets minus liabilities. So just to recap those um, primary concepts, capital is the amount of the owner's investment in the business. It is a credit by nature. To increase it, for example, if you have a profit, you credit the particular account. To decrease capital, where you make a loss, you debit it. Assets, on the other hand, are something of value that the business owns. For example, land, a motor vehicle, furniture. Assets by nature are debits. To increase an asset, you debit it. To decrease an asset, you credit it. The concept of a liability is something that a business owes. Liabilities are credits by nature. In essence, they're the opposite of an asset, which is a debit. So to increase a liability, you credit it. To decrease a liability, you debit it. There are also a couple of other um, concepts that um, in broad terms you should be familiar with. 
Firstly, expenses. They're recurrent expenditures of the business, which decrease profit. This could be electricity, rates, etc. They're a debit by nature. To increase an expense, you debit it. To decrease an expense, you credit it. Revenue are recurrent amounts that increase income, and they're credit by nature. To, in to increase them, you credit them. To decrease them, you debit them. For the double entry bookkeeping system, there are always two entries for every particular transaction, a debit and a corresponding credit. For example, if a business sells an asset in return for cash, the entry in the books will record the decrease to the asset by crediting the asset account. Remember the above rule is that assets are debit by nature and to decrease them you credit them. And by debiting the cash account, cash is an asset to the business and to increase it you debit it. Hence from that basic sales transaction your debits and credits are always equal. The same thing must occur in relation to trust accounting. There are obligations imposed by the Legal Profession Act 2007 in section 243. These obligations require you to establish a trust account, to keep and maintain that trust account, to ensure that the payment of uh, trust money occurs into and out of the trust account, and that all dealings with trust money are recorded, so you must always keep trust accounting records. You're required to engage an external examiner to examine your trust records. And you have an obligation for the payment of an amount into a prescribed account under section 285. It's also known as a statutory deposit. If you don't maintain your trust accounts, then you can incur a maximum penalty of 100 penalty units under section 247 of the Legal Profession Act. When you're considering uh, your trust accounting system, we'll be looking at it in terms of a manual system, but the same rules apply in relation to electronic systems. Essentially, there's four steps. There are source records, or your primary documents. There are secondary books of account, which record the transactions from the source documents. Then there are books of summary, which summarize the secondary books. And finally, there are reports which are generated from the manual system. In terms of the records that are required to be kept, these can be generally classified under a number of headings. The type of money involved, the type of source record, the secondary records required, the type of book of summary and the actual reports. And in fact, there are various types of um, money, and these include general trust money, controlled money, transit money, written direction money, power money, and investments. So for each of these six types of money, there are various source records, secondary records, books of summary, and reports that are generated there's a table which I've included in the PowerPoints for this particular um, presentation, which give you a summary of the um, types of source records, etc., for the various types of money. You'll need to spend some time becoming familiar with these different types of um, money and how they're dealt with in a trust accounting system. So I think the place to start then is to look at what is trust money. And this is defined in section 237 of the Act. So trust money is money received by a solicitor in the course of practice as a solicitor to be held on behalf of another person and must be either banked to the credit of a general trust account at an approved financial institution in Queensland, that is trust money, paid as directed by the person on whose behalf the money is held, this is transit money, dealt with under a power or authority for or on behalf of a person, that's power money, or 
held under the control of the solicitor and paid as directed by the person on whose behalf the money is held. That's written direction money. Trust accounts must be operated at approved um, ADIs, which are defined in sections 237 and 280 of the Act. So these are um, certain prescribed and approved financial institutions. It's very important to realise that trust money is not available for the payments of the debts of the practice, nor should be intermingled with other money. It must always be kept and accounted for separately from the practice's money. Trust accounting records must be kept in permanent form, and there are substantial fines for not um, keeping those records. There are particular types of source documents, which I'm going to spend a little bit of time about. The first is checks. Many of you are probably familiar with the, when you receive a check from somebody, you're perhaps not familiar with actually maintaining the check account and the writing and completing of check butts. The detailed requirements for checks and check butts are specified in Regulation 37. Please take some time and read that regulation. It is very detailed as to its requirements. And remember that your whole trust accounting system is only as good as the original source documents upon which it's based. A few things about checks. They become stale after 15 months under the Checks Act 1986 Commonwealth Section 3. However, in trust accounting, you really would become concerned after three months if a cheque's not been banked, and you'd really want to make some inquiries as to why that's the case. Also, uh, you may require clearance of cheques which have been received from clients and deposited at a bank. Um, those cheques must be cleared before you can draw against or take money out of a bank drawn against those particular checks which you've presented. A law practice who writes checks against deposits which have not yet cleared in their account uh, risks the dishonour of those particular checks and in fact uh, being in breach of the trust accounting requirements of the Act in Section 259. A special clearance simply means that the bank is paid to speed up the clearing process to ensure that cheques um, are valid. I have included an example of a trust account check butt. And once again, this is a source document which must be completed accurately. It indicates the name of the payee, that is the person to whom the check is going to be paid, the amount, and also um, how it's allocated in terms of which client matter the reason for it, and the actual sub-amounts if that's applicable. Note also that the cheque number on the cheque butt will match the number on the cheque actually given to the payee. We will now move on to another source document, namely a receipt. Trust account receipts record money that is received into the trust account. Money may take the form of cash, cheques which could be personal or bank cheques, and electronic transfers. When money is received, it must be deposited as soon as practicable in the trust account, that is the general trust account, unless under section 255, under the pain of a 100 penalty unit fine, firstly, the practice has a written direction by an appropriate person, that is a person legally entitled to give directions, to deal with it otherwise than by depositing it into the account. The money is controlled money, the money is transit money, or situations where the money is to be dealt with under a power to receive or disperse money for or on behalf of another person exercisable jointly and severally with the other person or a nominee of the other person. So they are the exceptions. The detailed requirements for receipts are all specified in Regulation 34. Now I've included in the PowerPoint slides uh, an example of a trust account receipt. And when you look at that, you'll see that there are various things listed. The name of the solicitor, the receipt number, the date, who it's received from, the amount in words and figures, the form in which the funds were received, for example, cash or telegraphic transfer or cheque, 
the particular client matter to which it relates and the reason for the particular money and the name of the person who made out the particular receipt. It's important that all of these requirements are met as they're all specified in the regulations. In particular, I would draw your attention to Regulation 40 with respect to the Trust Account Receipts Cash Book and Regulation 41 with respect to the Trust Account Payments Cash Book. Take the time to study those um, particular provisions. I've also included in the PowerPoints an example of a receipts cash book entry um, and you will be required to have a go at completing these particular um, documents. You'll note that the cash book has several columns related to it, date, the receipt number, um, who the receipt from the, the name of the particular person and the reason for it, the account name, if there's multiple amounts or, or if the amount received relates to multiple types of um, entries, they're broken up, the receipt amount and they're also the amount deposited that particular day. In terms of uh, the cash payments book, I've provided an example of that and you can see that the columns there are slightly different. You've got the date, the check number, um, to whom it was paid and the reason, the account name, the matter number, and a description of the matter, if there's a multiple amount, so what it relates to, and then the actual check amounts. It's important that, um, again, with these types of uh, source documents, that they're accurate. Let's move on then to the trust ledger. This is the ledger which tracks the payments uh, to and from a particular client. And there are two parts to the trust ledger, and it's based on the double entry bookkeeping principle that for every debit, there's a corresponding credit. The individual trust ledger accounts are individual accounts. That is, there is one of these trust ledgers for each particular client matter. So if you have a client that has several matters, there would be a trust ledger for each of those matters. The entries come from posting individual items from the cash receipts um, book and the payments cash book. The receipts are credited to the individual client ledger accounts because the law practices holding money for the client and the payments are debited, which are the opposite of a credit. To reduce a credit, um, you do the opposite and debit. So uh, in the PowerPoints, I've provided you with an example of a trust ledger for a particular client. So it identifies the client, the account name, their address, the particular matter, and then it um, includes all of the debits and credits uh, in relation to that particular client matter. From that, um, you can produce a trust trial balance. And what this is, is simply a listing of individual trust ledger balances for all of the clients, which gives you a trust trial balance, which you then reconcile or compare with the cash book balances as at a particular time. And those um, particular comparisons should result in no variance. There should be no difference between the total of the trust trial balance and the reconciled cash books. If they don't balance, then you've made an error and you need to correct that. So that's basically trust money. The next category we'll briefly look at is controlled money. Now, controlled money is a form of trust money. However, it's dealt with separately from general trust money. Different ledgers are there just to keep track of different types of trust money. And these requirements for controlled money are found in regulations 47 through to 51. Take the time and read those thoroughly. The controlled money ledger is a separate ledger that contains all the individual controlled money movement records or accounts for each particular client. Details from the controlled money receipts are posted to the individual client controlled money movement records in the controlled money ledger. And at the end of each month, Within 15 days of the end of the month, the law practice must prepare a controlled money listing report, which is a list of the controlled money accounts. And it's very important that all of the, the client's monies are appropriately tracked. 
Then there will be an improved ADI statement. The trust ADI statement needs to be reconciled against the trust accounts at the end of each month. There should be no bank fees and there should be no interest. If, if they have in fact charged bank fees, you're going to have to get that um, um, corrected. And if they've provided interest, they shouldn't have as well. Checks which are deposited are identified as a result have a debit, that is they reduce the balance of the account as money is leaving the account when checks are drawn upon. And deposits, whether they're cash, checks or telegraphic transfers, result in a credit. That is, it increases the amount of available funds in this particular trust account. I've included in the PowerPoints an example of a reconciliation statement. So essentially what this does is that it has the balance at the end of a particular month, less any outstanding deposits or receipts which haven't yet been entered. And then that is um, adjusted by looking at um, things such as unreceipted deposits, and in particular, and these are quite common, outstanding checks. These are checks which you've written but have not yet been presented by the person to whom you've given them. Um, they have to be taken into account when you're doing your reconciliation. You would then add back any bank charges which have been debited in error, and you take um, uh, account of any cash books not in an approved ADI statement, which would be pretty uncommon. So that would then give you the reconciled cash book balance as at the end of the particular month, which should balance within this reconciliation statement. And it's important that you learn how to do these reconciliation statements, as after all, you have to account for your client's money. And that accounting is subject to audit procedures. Investigations are conducted under Chapter 3, Part 3.3 Division 3 of the Legal Profession Act. The Law Society itself may initiate or, or be asked by the Commissioner to initiate an investigation under Section 263 if it's felt that there are irregularities in trust accounting. Um, the investigations may, according to Section 263, be either routine investigations on a regular or other basis, or they might be investigations in relation to particular allegations or suspicions regarding trust money, trust property, trust accounts, or any other aspect of the affairs of the law practice. The principal purposes of an investigation are to ascertain whether the law practice has complied with or is complying with the requirements of Part 3.3, the associated regulations with the objective of trying to detect and prevent fraud or defalcation. But it doesn't limit the scope of the investigation or the quite broad powers of the investigator. An Australian legal practitioner is guilty of an offence carrying a maximum 200 penalty unit fine if she or he, without reasonable excuse, causes a deficiency in a trust account or a failure to pay or deliver any trust money. There's also an obligation on trust practitioners and their associates on becoming aware of a trust accounting irregularity to give written notice of that irregularity to the law society or corresponding regulatory authority, or you risk a 50 penalty unit fine. So there are requirements for you to maintain trust accounts correctly, and there's an obligation on you to inform if you discover or become aware that trust accounting irregularities are occurring. The Legal Profession Act itself in section 285 and in regulations 70 and 71 require every solicitor with a minimum balance in excess of $3,000 in their trust account to deposit with the Chief Executive of the Department of Justice and Attorney General special deposit account an amount equal to two-thirds of the lowest combined balance um, during the previous year of that trust account. So what this is doing is in effect um, requiring a substantial component of the trust accounts balances to be held by the Department of Justice and Attorney General in a special deposit account rather than sitting in the actual solicitor's trust account. 
There are variations in these requirements and it's important that you thoroughly understand Part 8, Division 8 of the regulations. The, um, an important aspect of these um, deposits into this um, prescribed accounts is that that particular prescribed account does earn interest, unlike the trust account balances maintained by solicitors. And that interest um, essentially goes to the public purpose fund and is used for various purposes. Um, and it's a, a very useful source of um, revenue uh, for distinct purposes. So I'm going to conclude at this point just to emphasize to you that trust accounting is not easy, particularly for uh, lawyers who've had no accounting background. It's going to take you several weeks of gradually working through the regulations and rules and having a go at the particular tutorial questions that I've set before you'll begin to understand how this process works. And it's best learnt by doing practical problems, which I've um, provided to you. And I will, after you've discussed these through discussion threads, give you answer guides as to how they work so that you get a better understanding of the requirements of the Act and regulations, how trust accounting receipts and deposits, checks and cash books, journals, ledgers, reconciliations, authorities, as well as the other types of money, such as controlled money, and ultimately the prescribed account deposits, how all of that works. So have a go at the five tutorial questions, and you'll come to grips with a very important practical topic. Thanks very much.